Good morning, Southside. It is a joy for me to be with you this morning. It's been quite some time since I have been here and opened the word together with you. So I'm so excited for the opportunity. And I have to say, this time through, I've been so, so enjoying Romans. Um, it's been my meditation for many, many, many months, and it's greatly influenced my thought it's on the uh, passage that is going to be before us this morning. So if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11, we'll be looking this morning at verses 1 through 16. And I encourage you, we're only going to get through uh, the first 16 verses. This, this passage is, is much bigger than that. Uh, these verses are part of the longest narrative in the Gospels on a miracle Jesus did. And that is the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And there's much more um, in the following verses after verse 16. So I encourage you to go and to read those even this afternoon. But, but I can say that the truths that I've been seeing in this narrative have been so paradigm shifting and comforting to me over the last few months. And as many of you can testify, my, my excitement over this passage has gotten the best of me. And, and I've shared a little bit of what the Lord has been showing me in it. So I pray this morning as we, we dig into this text, it will be just as exciting for you as it has been uh, for me. Um, if there's one thing that comes out over and over throughout all of Scripture, it is the love of God. But if there is one attribute that of, of God that is so often abused and seen to overshadow and supplant every other attribute of God, it is His love. This morning, though, I pray we will see a biblical view of that love. The love of God is such a glorious attribute and one that sets the stage for the gospel. And we must understand it rightly. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him would have eternal life. This is there are, this verse is the most widely known verse in all of the Bible and on, on the love of God. And, and it really is the gospel in a nutshell. And then as we dig into that nutshell, just a bit, we see the love of God defined for his people. We saw in Romans 8, 29, that God's love was shown in his foreknowledge of us. That intimate saving love being set on us before the foundations of even the earth. And then in time, we see Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a humbling and awe-inspiring facet of the, of the diamond of the gospel that verse is. That while we hated him, he came to die for us and love us and bring to fruition that foreknowledge of us that he had before the foundation of the world. In Romans 8, we're looking at with Ken when we finally get to that section. We're going to be comforted by the amazing promises of God in, the, in his love. In verse 35, the question is presented. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? <sighs> But then the answer comes so gloriously in verses 38 to 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are monumental promises from the word of God that give so much comfort to the believer, and rightfully so, because in these verses, it, it sets on display one of the greatest pieces of the puzzle of redemption. Ephesians chapter 1 sets on display so vividly in verses 3 through 6. He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. But what's the heart of that blessing and choosing of us? He goes on and says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
you get that? In love, he predestined us. Verse 5 tells us the heart of God in choosing us. But what was the, that loving predestination and adoption unto? If you see in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. That is the glorious goal of the love of God. It's to the praise of his glory. And rightly understood, that is what all scripture tells us is the essence of God's love for us. In Romans, it's Romans 8, 29. Those whom he foreknew, that, that deep, intimate knowledge and love, as we saw with Ken a few weeks ago, those he predestined and called and justified and glorified, that his glorious grace would be set on display and we would bow and worship him for all of eternity as we see and view his glory. And that is exactly what I believe we will see in our text this morning in John chapter 11. So I pray as we work our way through these verses, you'll be overwhelmed as I was, as we behold together this morning the glory of God that is set on display in these verses. Our text this morning, as I said, it's a narrative that tells us of the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. But I believe this story, it's a backdrop to something that is so much greater than the miracle in and of itself. I think, I think it's a point not only for John telling us the story in detail, but also the very reason God sovereignly orchestrated this event described by John. This passage, if we look at it closely is a text that gives us a front row seat to the love of God. And I pray when we're done looking at this, we would understand that love of God in such a deeper way, in a way that makes the glory of God and us delighting in it God's chief end. And as we look at John 11, notice with me, if you will, a couple of hints that tell me that John is going to great lengths to set the stage for God's love through this story. In verse 3, John says, So the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Verse 5, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. John could have just mentioned that Lazarus was ill. He could have left out mentioning that, that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and it wouldn't have changed the events that he's about to describe at all. But John seems to be going out of his way here to emphasize Jesus' love for this family. In fact, look at verses 1 and 2 with me real quick. You see an interesting point that, uh, that John makes. He says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Do you notice the description of Mary, who was the brother of Lazarus? Not only did John mention the fact that she anointed his feet and wiped them with her hair, a point that no doubt shows, uh, it shows her love for Jesus, but you notice something odd about what you know, John mentioning this here in John chapter 11? If you did, I think you'll agree it highlights how John is trying to emphasize Jesus' love and relationship with this family. What's interesting is that this event has not even happened yet chronologically in chapter 11. The story of Mary anointing Christ's feet doesn't happen until John chapter 12. But here, John is giving us a quick foreview, I believe, to set the stage for this amazing picture and demonstration of the love of God. Over and over, John tells us how much he loves Mary, how much he loves Martha, how much he loved Lazarus, including an act of love alluded to that hasn't even happened yet chronologically. Love, no doubt, is the theme that John is driving at here in this chapter. But what may surprise you as we move along in this text is how Jesus loved them. And I believe how he loves us. That's what we want to see this morning. Look at me real quick with verses 5 and 6, John chapter 11. 
Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was at. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, or therefore, when he heard Lazarus is ill, he stayed two days longer where he was at. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, 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 I had to back up for just a minute and ask, is that how I define love? Because that is how John just defined it for us. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so he stayed two days longer. And that was mind-blowing for me. And I, I had to ask, uh, ask what it is about God's love that would cause it to be defined by what seems to be such an impersonal act as this. It seems to make no sense to acknowledge someone you love is about to die, and because of your love for them, your life just stays status quo for another two days. That is, unless you are God. Unless you are God and have a much greater and glorious purpose for all that you ordain and do. And what I believe we will see in this passage as, we, as well as all throughout all of Scripture is a redefining of God's love for us. The world and mainstream of evangelicalism wants you to believe God's love is all about you. And his desire is for you to have your best life now. But I believe what John sets out for you to see about God's love in this passage will be completely different than that. I believe we will see the love of God for us to find not in what we think we need most, but rather what God says we need most. So I think we're going to see two things in this passage. What is God's love all about? Number one, that we would see the glory of God. And number two, that we would believe. Let's pray. Father, this morning, your amazing love for us is set on display in this passage. Even as you loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, we're going to see how, how you loved them was setting your infinite glory on display in front of them. And Father, I know that is how you love us. And I just pray that we would, we would bow at the foot of the cross and see your glory and love you for what you are showing us. I pray that, I pray that your glory would be set on display in front of us and we would bow and worship and know that all the trials throughout life are going to point to that one thing, your glory and our faith. Father, thank you for those amazing truths. May you teach us these things this morning in your name. Amen. So, first, the goal of the love of God, that we would see the glory of God. Look with me back at verses uh, 3 and 4 of this chapter. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. I don't know about you, but, but I find Jesus' comment to be interesting. And, and one, we need to examine what he means by it. When we read in verse 14, uh, Jesus telling his disciples plainly, Lazarus has died. And we know since we've already read ahead, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the grave here in a few verses. And that, that's why he says, this illness is not unto death. But I want you to hold your minds in this text here that we're at for just a few more minutes. Far too often, we, and, and myself included, we jump to the end. We always miss what God has for us in the middle of the passage. We must not forget that though Jesus said this illness is not unto death, well, Lazarus still died. Lazarus went through the experience of death. And Mary and Martha, they went through the gut-wrenching anguish of losing their brother to death while Jesus is nowhere to be found. They go through all of the burial procedures, wrapping their brother and anointing him and then putting him in the grave. 
And you can just feel the anguish in their hearts as Mary and Martha both come to Jesus saying the very same thing. In verse 21, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In verse 32, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You see, they experienced firsthand the pain of death. And I want us to remember that before we move on. Because though we see Jesus doing an amazing miracle in the lives of of this family, I want you to see the miracle from their point of view for just a moment. Think about your own life experiences and set them in the context of God's sovereignty. Is God sovereign over every single event in all of our lives, orchestrated every moment of our lives, as Romans 8.28 told us? Is that true? Absolutely it is true. And he's doing that for our good and for his glory, as we saw when we went through that verse. But in the moment, you are still experiencing all of the waves of the trial. You are still experiencing the pain of some of those circumstances because many times they do lead to death. And I'm sorry to break the Joel Osteen bubble, but God's love for you does not mean that he gives you your best life now in the physical way that he's trying to sell the church on. But there is one thing I can guarantee you from the word of God, and it is this. Though God may take you through trials that will at times crush you and cause you to question what God is doing in your life, he is absolutely doing one thing that makes it all worth it in the end. He is setting on display the glory of God in every moment of your trial. And his glory is what defines his love for you. This passage, as we began seeing, has the love of Christ all over it for this family. And yet Jesus makes it clear, this illness is not unto death, but it is unto the glory of God. What that tells me, along with the circumstances God used to set that glory on display, is this. This family, get this, seeing the glory of God was worth every moment of pain it took for them to see it and then to glory in it. And I believe it is the same truth for us. That glory is so infinitely valuable, so deeply humbling and faith building that God will do whatever it takes in our lives to set that glory on display. Whatever it takes to show us his magnificent glory and cause our hearts then to delight in it. You see, we read about God's glory in his word and and maybe it gets worked into our heads, but scripture shows us the doctrine of suffering is often what it takes to move that knowledge from the head down into the heart. Sometimes it takes being face to face with cancer that that once terrified you to death. But in the middle of it, you see the glory of God being set on display as you find yourself in a room full of people and God uses you to set the glory of God on display in the gospel as you share it. And then it transforms your fear, the fear you once had into a worship and a joy in the glory of God as you experience that glory that is better than life to you. Psalm 63, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. And that steadfast love, I believe, is defined here in our text as giving us what we need most. What do we need most? A revelation of the glory of God. That's what your soul needs most. And that's what the gospel is all about. It is to give us God. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might what? that he might bring us to God. Not to the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, not to finding your best life now. The the point of the gospel is to bring us to God and enjoy God and to bask in the reality that his steadfast love is better than life. And why? Because we get God. So if the glory of God is the goal of the gospel, 
And if the definition of God's love for us is doing whatever it takes for us to see and to delight in the glory of God, then this text tells us that even death and all the pain that goes along with it is oftentimes what the love of God uses to show us the infinite glory of God and our cause our hearts to delight in Him and in His glory. To those of you who have been through these deep and dark trials, you know in the depths of your hearts what I'm talking about. You've seen God take you through the valley of the shadow of death and then right there in the middle of that valley lead you beside still waters where you drink deep of Him. And then you find He is infinitely satisfying. You see, I've watched men dying in a hospital not wanting that trial to end because the communion with God in that moment has been so glorious, and it's all because of what that trial has brought in their lives. To see this illustrated in vivid form, I want you to look with me real quick at the story of Job. Remember Job 1.1 where there was a man, says, in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. Did you pick up on that description of Job? Did you get it? He is a righteous man by God's description. One that knew God. But God wants to do something in Job's life that he can only do one way. One way. So verse 8. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? See, God is the one here who mentions Job to Satan, knowing exactly what he desires to teach him through the trial that, is, uh, that Job is about to enter into. We all know the story uh, as God allows all of his livestock to be taken and all that he owns and then his children to be killed. What a massive trial God has brought into the life of Job, but he's not done with him yet. God then allows Satan to afflict Job with sores all over his body, and he sits there in the ashes as he scrapes them away. And then his wife comes and tells him to curse God and die. His friends come and tear at his character and tell him he's a sinner who will not repent. And all those things, no doubt, piling on Job and bringing uh, bringing things to the surface that Job would have never knew were in his heart without this trial. And we sit and ask, what in the world is God doing in Job's life that he would take him through all of these things? But then God speaks to Job for four chapters and shows him how infinitely great and mighty and all-knowing and powerful and glorious he is. And he puts Job in his rightful place and sets his glory on display before him. And finally, then Job responds to all that he has seen and all this massive what all this massive trial has revealed to him. And he says in Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is it that hides counsel with knowledge, without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I had heard of you, get this, with by the hearing of the ear, uh, but now my eyes see you. Job's response says it all. When Job finally saw God in all of his glory, it was enough for him. Job repents and sees now the depths of his pride before God, and he is humbled as he sees God in all of his glory. And you know what? It was enough for Job then. Notice the, God never tells Job why he put them through this, or why he put him through this massive trial. But yet in the text, Job is at peace because he sees and knows God so much greater now than he did before. To the world, that makes no sense the children of God, that is glorious. Because in the middle of those devastating trials, the child of God knows their father is working all things for his glory and their good. They see and experience in the midst of their pain, the peace of God that passes all understanding that guards their hearts and their minds in Christ. 
And we see the love of God in those trials stirring a faith that believes God all the more. So back to our text in, in John 11, verses 14 and 15. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. There's our second point about the love of God for his children. That you may believe. You see, Christ tells his disciples in verse 4, the illness of Lazarus is for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. But at this point, they have no idea what that's going to mean. As far as they're concerned, Jesus' statement makes it pretty clear. This illness is not unto death. So, so for him to stay two days longer where he was at, it didn't seem like any big deal. In fact, to go where Lazarus was would mean they would have to go right back to the place where the Jews wanted to kill him. But then it came time for Jesus to go to Lazarus and, and to set his glory on display before them and to Mary and Martha. And the disciples don't get it. Jesus tells him he's going to awaken Lazarus and they, they think, well, if he's falling asleep, well, won't he just wake up? But then Jesus spells it out for him. Lazarus has died. And in a few verses, Jesus will glorify himself before the disciples and Mary and Martha and even Lazarus and all the Jews that are there at the grave. But for now, all the disciples know is that Jesus loved this family dearly. They no doubt had many interactions with all of them. They've had a front row seat to witness the love of, of Jesus for them. But yet Jesus did not run to this family in their time of need. And he stayed behind for two days. And now it's been made to, clear to them the seriousness of the whole situation when they hear that Lazarus has died. But now he tells them, and by de default us, something that I think is amazing. He tells them, I am glad I was not there. Jesus uses the word, uh, the Greek word Cairo. It means to be glad or to rejoice over something. Think about that for a moment. There's only a, approximately three times in all of Scripture where Jesus is said to rejoice over something. Do you know that? This is one of them. And Jesus says he rejoices in the fact that he was not there when Lazarus died. Why? Why? And here is the glorious why. That they may believe. You see, Jesus rejoiced in knowing that he was not there to keep Lazarus from dying because he knew that when he showed them what his love was really all about, they would believe in him so much deeper. The eyes of their faith would be open to Christ and his glory in a way that they had never been before. And friends, that is what defines God's love for us. Doing whatever it takes, even bringing deep and dark trials in our lives for us to see the glory of God. And then having that vision of God's glory deepen our faith in him to be steadfast and immovable. 1 Peter 1, 6 or 9 says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that, here's the purpose, the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, and there's your trials, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Those trials divinely orchestrated by God at times test our faith so deeply, we feel exactly what Paul, or Peter is saying in this text. We feel as though our faith is being tested and proven even by fire. And it hurts as the dross is melted and it comes to the top. But Peter tells us the one goal of the testing of our faith is to result in the praise and the glory of, and the honor of Jesus Christ. It produces a deeper love for God and a deeper faith in him as we watch his faithfulness to us in the midst of those deep, dark trials. It produces a faith that rejoices in him with a joy that Peter says in this text is inexpressible and full 
of glory. And oh, how God glorifying it is when our deep trials and crushing pain results in us finding more joy and delight in him than we ever did before that trial. John Piper's coined a phrase that says, God is most glorified in us when we are what? Most satisfied in him. And how true that is. When the people of God find ultimate delight and satisfaction in God, a delight that transcends every earthly joy and allurement. A satisfaction in God that says, though he slay me, yet I will praise him. When God is the source of our satisfaction above all, above all else, then God is glorified above all else. Paul, when given the thorn in the flesh from God, says this in 2 Corinthians 12, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that I, it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, and here, here's Paul's response to God's loving design of the trial. Therefore, I will boast in him all the more gladly of my weakness. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And that is exactly what we see being played out for us right here in John chapter 11. God's intimate and deep love for this family has orchestrated the very events, the very painful events that would give them what they need most. And that is a view of his infinite glory that led to a deeper faith and a deeper trust in him. Isn't that exactly what we've been seeing in Romans 8 so far? Remember back verse 16 and 18? The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. In order that, we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. If we are the children of God, then two promises from that text are sure in our lives. Number one, that we will be heirs with God and fellow heirs with Christ. And number two, we will be glorified with him. Do you get that? We will inherit God and we will be glorified with him. It will be the answer to the prayer Christ made in John 17 for us. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. We will be with Christ, beholding him in all of his glory, just as Christ prayed but there is a part of what Paul said here in Romans 8 in between the two promises that we, many of us want to skip over. Paul says, provided we suffer with him. You see, suffering is part of the package. It's part of the package because it is the tool that God uses to bring us to the end of ourselves and to show his glorious faithfulness. But all saints, don't forget verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. That's what I can't wait for. To see the infinite glory of God that is to be revealed to us. And because it is infinite, we will spend eternity seeing more and more of that glory. The glory of Christ will never be exhausted and we will never come to see it all. Christ prayed that we would be with him and that we would see his glory and the rest of scripture tells us that is exactly what God is going to bring to pass. You see, these truths are the bedrock that we live our lives on now. These truths are what drive a family with 12 kids to lose their life in ministry in another country. They sacrifice and lay it all on the line for the glory of the gospel that men might see that glory and come to believe. 
These are the truths that take dear saints through cancer that once struck fear into the depths of their hearts. But when God ministers his grace to them, that peace that passes all understanding comes and it guards their hearts and their minds in Christ. And the gospel then overflows out of them to the chemo patients that are around them. It's these bedrock truths that let us grieve with hope as loved ones go to be with the Lord and then beg others to enter that hope by faith. And it's these truths that enable you to endure long COVID and your physical body wasting away, but do it in hope. And hope that God will not waste one heartache or pain or fear that does not cause you in the end to see the glory of God set on display in your life. When you go through these trials, yes, the pain is real. And all the fears are real. And I never want to minimize any of those things. But before, or before the believer, we endure those pains and fears with a hope and a faith and a trust that God is working all of these things in our lives to manifest his glory in us and to the world. In the midst of your trials, there is hope in your pain. In the midst of your cancer and long COVID and, and wayward children that break your heart as they chase after the world. In the midst of financial disasters or events that change everything in our lives. And yes, even in those times when we sin and sin deeply and the consequences of that sin are painful and devastating. Yes, even in those times, God is working to show you his glorious faithfulness as he roots out sin and self out of your heart. Yes, in all these things, there is hope. And we should be looking forward to what God is doing in us to set himself on display in our lives. Saints of God, do we believe this is the love of God for you? I believe that is the lesson of John 11 for us this morning. That God loves us so much, he will do whatever is necessary, even deep and dark trials for us to see and to experience what is infinitely glorious. God himself. That song that we sang this morning, I, put, I believe puts it all into perspective. I want to remind you of the words that we sang he says, waking up to a new sunrise and looking back from the other side. I can see now with open eyes, darkest water and deepest pain. But I wouldn't trade it for anything. Because my brokenness brought me to you. And these wounds are a story you'll use. So I'm thankful for the scars. Because without them, I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are. So forever I am thankful for the scars. Now I'm standing in confidence with the strength of your faithfulness. And I'm not who I was before. No, I don't have to fear anymore. So I'm thankful for the scars. Because without them I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are. So forever I'm thankful for the scars. And then what makes all of that possible he goes on to say, I can see, I can see how you delivered me. In your hands and in your feet, I found my victory. So I'm thankful for your scars. Because without them, I wouldn't know your heart. And with my life, I'll tell of who you are. So forever, I am thankful for your scars. Let's pray. Father, this morning we are so, so humbled by your infinite glory. Father, it is so worth it for us to experience whatever pain and trial you take us through that we would see and understand and find delight in that glory. Oh, Father, I pray that we as your people would see that is your infinite love for us. Father, giving us what we think we need now does nothing for us. What we need for all of eternity is everything for us. Father, I pray that you would cause our hearts to delight in Jesus Christ even more. 
Father, thank you for your gift of Christ on the cross that takes away all of our sin, that he, all of your wrath was poured out on him for us. Thank you for such an infinite gift. Father, I pray that you would humble us and teach us through each and every one of these trials that you bring us through. And may we look with anticipation to see what you are, glory, are doing and setting your glory on display before us. And oh, Father, may you deepen our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ all the more. In your son's name, amen.